How do you make sure your faith is growing in the right direction? How do you make sure your faith is growing in the right direction? Welcome, I'm Pastor Yancey Valdez. Welcome to Columbia Life Church. It is the weekly gathering where together we create a sacred space for people to come and let God breathe new life and bring renewal into people's lives through faith, hope, and love in Jesus Christ. And if you're new at, uh, with us at Church City or joining us online or just stopping by, let me encourage you to go to, to follow along with today's gathering experience by going to columbialifechurch.org. Click on the link that says, I'm new. Or if you just want to say hello, click on, that, like, click on that link as well. But if you click the link that says, I'm new, we've got a great surprise for you there. And at that time, at the same time, you'll get a better idea about who we are, a better glimpse of our heart to serve God and make a difference in people's lives and in the world we live in. So how do you make sure your faith is growing in the right direction? What kind of habits do we need to build to make sure our faith is going in the right direction? How, how can I build better habits, reinforce them, make improvements to make sure my faith is growing in the right direction? In our current series, we've been focusing on building better habits, healthier habits, spirit-empowered habits that will enable us to be more consistent, more faithful in living a life that pleases God, the life uh, we've always been meant to live in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. More specifically, we have been looking at the Apostle Peter's second letter to the New Testament churches. These churches were not only dealing with persecution on the outside, but also with false teachers spreading false teachings and philosophies that were undermining the authority of the scriptures, the authority of the Spirit-inspired scriptures. And so in order for early believers in the early church to not be misled, nor let their grow, their, uh, grow their faith in a way that is contrary to God's word, the apostle Peter basically gives them kind of a roadmap. He sends this letter, and he was basically telling them, this is, your, your faith is meant to grow. Your faith is meant to grow. It's, it was his letter to the church, and it was meant to deal with false teaching, and, but he wanted them to know right off the bat that the faith you have been given, the faith that, that was cultivated, that was, was birthed in your life through the birth of Jesus Christ, it is meant to grow. When you receive Jesus, you haven't arrived. You're just beginning, and your faith is meant to grow. And so he tells them in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, he says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Don't worry about these false teachers that are saying you don't have enough, or you need this, or you need to add this to your faith. He's saying, listen, you have everything you need by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life, a life that pleases God. We have received all this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous grace, by his mar marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. Everybody say promises. 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 Man, promises tell us where the future's headed. Promises are great signs of where God's taken us. Promises give us great revelation into God's agenda. I mean, just think about it. If our agenda aligned with his agenda, wouldn't that be cool? When you think of all the promises, he's given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. And then in verse five, he, he says, in view of all this, I just want everybody to just take your hands and make some binoculars. Okay, remember, it's, it's in view of all this, in view of everything. He says, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. And then he says this, and we're going to get into this part today. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Supplement your faith. Some of, uh, uh, other versions may say, be diligent to add to your faith virtue. Be diligent to add to your faith moral virtue. Um, moral excellence. It's almost like Peter's saying, you have this faith, this is the next step to take. You have your faith, this is, this is the direction you your faith should now be taking you to. You see, this morning, I want to talk to you about the habit of moral excellence and to consider the question, how do you make sure your faith is growing in the right direction, in a healthy direction, in the best direction? You understand that while our faith is meant to grow, it also can be led astray. It can be led astray. And, and, and we would be prideful 
to think that our faith cannot lead, that, that bad faith cannot lead us into a bad direction. You know, we're, we're growing. If, if, if our faith is meant to grow, if we are called to be a teachable spirit, we want to listen to things, right? We want to learn, we want to grow, but at the same time, we know that these promises have come to us as we've gotten to know Jesus more and more and more. I mean, as much as we know about Jesus, there's still more, much more to be learned. That, the, the, the depth of that relationship is, is lifelong. And although, while our, fa- our faith is meant to grow, it can, also be, it can also be led astray. Moral excellence calls us to Christ. Moral ex- excellence calls us to the fruit of the Spirit, of displaying His character, of, discler- of de- displaying His person, uh, personhood, of displaying His image, of, being, of embracing the call to be an image bearer of Christ. To represent who he is. It calls us to direct our faith in a direction for, our, for the life we have been meant to live in relationship with him. It keeps our lives from growing astray. Moving our faith towards moral excellence keeps our lives from going astray. So how do you make sure? I want to take us to Luke chapter 19, uh, just as a way to expand the thought of moral excellence here. In Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, Luke was a man in the Bible. He was a physician. He was known as a a, uh, physician. He was a companion of the apostle Paul. And and what's significant about Luke is that Luke was not a Jewish person. He was a Gentile. And so really, he's uh, he's really the only Gentile author in the Bible. And so it's, it's literally a book written by a Gentile for Gentiles. So I'm not Jewish, so I know it's gotta be, I gotta be included in part of this that it was written by a Gentile for Gentiles. And, and really his two books between the Gospel of Luke and Acts are really one book, one book together, just two volumes. And together they tell the story of how God first invited people, the people of Israel, and then all nations to follow Jesus. It starts with that. It starts with inviting the people of Israel and then all nations to follow Jesus. As a Gentile in New Testament times, Luke came after the birth, uh, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he was, he was thankful. He was thankful to, as a Gentile to be included among God's family. He received the good news of Jesus Christ, and, and, and he moved from an old life to a new life, and, and he stepped into his calling. And it's interesting because when you read Luke's gospel, you can't help but notice that it's filled with stories about marginalized people. Luke's emphasis is that, is that in his message is that God's Messiah has come to his people, Israel, with the promised inclusion of Gentiles, of marginalized people. And Luke claims, in this portion of Scripture we're going to read today, especially when we get to verse 10, he claims that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. This is what he came to do. Including every kind of marginalized person whom tradition or organized religion would put outside their boundaries. He came to include everybody. Salvation for Luke means God's acceptance and forgiveness of sinners, which is good news to the poor. All those who have been marginalized by society at large and especially by the religious power brokers of his time. He says they are lost. They are lost. And so he comes and... and, Really, this passage here that we're coming into, the, the context of the passage is that uh, it's situated right before Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's getting ready to approach Jerusalem. The, the, he's, been on, he's been doing his ministry for some three, three and a half years. Um, Jesus has been making an impact in the region he's been living in for the, his public ministry the last three and a half years. He just raised Lazarus from the dead. There is a buzz in the air. And he's getting ready to go to Jerusalem. He's getting ready to pass by Jericho. And Jericho is a city, it's kind of located, it's, it's kind of located near an oasis down at the bottom. Jerusalem's on a hill, and so to get to, get to Jerusalem, you have to go up, go up quite a bit of elevation. It's quite a hike from Jericho all the way up to Jerusalem. But this was the trek that Jesus was making. And as he's approaching the city, Luke tells us that the city was in an uproar. Jesus had just raised, again, Lazarus from the dead from the grave. And as Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind beggar was sitting beside the road. And when he heard the noise of the crowd going past, he asked, what's happening? And they told him that Jesus the Nazarene is going by. I remember, I remember when the Olympics came to, came to Los Angeles in 1984. Yeah, I'm that old. 
and when the Olympics came to 1984, I remember when the torch was, they were lighting the torch and they were going to run the torch. And I remember a buddy and I, we got in our old car and we, we were trying, we wanted to see the torch. I don't know why, we just wanted to go do it. And we had to find where it was on the route and we had to get, we had to get out, we had to park, park the car, get to the, get to the curb ahead of the torch in order to see the torch coming. And this, this, is, this is this blind beggar. He, he's hearing about Jesus. It's, it's in an uproar. Jesus is getting ready to pass by. It's something powerful, and you know Jesus is getting ready to pass by. I mean, if that doesn't get your, your, your blood going, you, you must really be dead because that's a huge thing. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last, he's getting ready to pass by. His kingdom is at hand, and he's coming. And so he began shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The people in front of him were yelling, be quiet, shh, stop it, shh. But all the more he kept yelling, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He kept telling him, be quiet. But check this out, it says the context again. This is the context, when Jesus heard him, he stopped. I mean, Jesus walking around, as soon as he heard his voice, he stopped. That cry for mercy stopped Jesus in his tracks. That cry for mercy stopped Jesus in, a tra- in his tracks. When he heard him, he stopped, and he ordered that the man be brought to him. And as the man came near, Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? That's an awesome question, especially if that's coming from him. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, he said, I want to see. And Jesus said, all right, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus, praising God and all who saw it praised God too. This was quite a different reception than the one Joshua had received when he went to Jericho. They were forcing him out. <laughs> it was a quick, different re- uh, reception. But it didn't stop Jesus from showing up and causing the blind to see. And then we get to this portion of Scripture in verse 19, in chapter 19, verse 1, it says that Jesus entered Jericho. Again, this is the uproar. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. And then verse 2 says, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very rich. So check out this scene. We have Jesus entering Jericho. He's making his way through it. There's a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. Understand Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a man who was not very well liked. If you would describe who Zacchaeus was, he is the guy that society has given up on. They don't like him because he's collecting taxes for the Roman government. And he's not liked. He's not, he doesn't have a very good reputation. Uh, he's collecting taxes as tribute to the Roman Empire. Um, he is a man whom others had given up on. The story of Zacchaeus is only written, it's interesting that the story of Zacchaeus, it's only written in, the, in, in Luke. It's not, Matthew doesn't talk about Zacchaeus. Mark doesn't talk about Zacchaeus. John doesn't talk about Zacchaeus, but Luke does. And it represents in Luke's mind what Jesus' ministry was all about, which is to lead God, which is to lead to God those whom others have given up on. To lead to God those whom others have given up on. He came to lead to God those whom others had given up on. You ever been at that place where you feel like the world's just given up on you? This is what Jesus came to do. Here's a guy, a tax collector. He had a past, and it's not a very good one. He is Jewish, but by, the way, by way of his chosen occup- occupation, he has basically betrayed his own people. Not just collecting taxes for the oppressive Roman Empire, but cheating his people and lining his own pockets in the process. He made his own bed. If, if he was not going to live like a Jewish person, he would at least reap his own consequences as far as community life was concerned. He was basically shunned from his own society. You might as well treat this tax collector like a leper. Unclean, unclean. Keep him out of our community, outside of our boundaries. 
And he had a bad reputation because of it. You ever been there? You kind of make your own bed and you had to enjoy it. <laughs> you ever felt like people have given up on you? Maybe you felt like you've given up on yourself. I'm here to tell you today, Jesus hasn't given up on you. He hasn't given up on me. He hasn't given up on you. Jesus' ministry is all about leading to God those whom others have given up on. So we have a problem here. Verse 3 tells us that he tried to get a look at Jesus, Zacchaeus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. And so he had a problem. He, he knew Jesus was coming by. I mean, he's been like ta collecting taxes for a long time. He had a, 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 doing it for long enough to have a bad year of reputation. Jesus has been, on the, been doing his ministry for the last three and a half years. Zacche it hasn't affected Zacchaeus' life, but all of a sudden he realizes Jesus is passing by and decides, you know what? I need to go take a look. I don't know exactly what was going on in his life at this time, but obviously he couldn't see Jesus. He hadn't seen Jesus, and, and now that he was passing by, he was too short to get a view of Jesus, and so he's going to have to fix this problem. Jesus was passing by, and he wanted to see him. And so it says in verse 4 that he ran ahead, and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. So he was a little resourceful. He knew that Jesus was going to pass by. He ran ahead. And then we have in verse 5, the encounter. Verse 5 says that when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick. Everybody say quick. Yes. Quick. Come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Now, that's so awesome because... I love this about Jesus because he's getting ready to pass by. Jesus is getting ready to pass by. Zacchaeus wants to see him. He wants to see him. And so he climbs up, climbs up the tree so he can get a little higher, look over the crowd. And can you imagine you're seeing Jesus pass by? And Jesus is passing by. Just imagine this. I mean, Jesus is passing by. Zacchaeus is looking at him, and Jesus is like this. You may see me, but I see you. You may see me, but I, I see you too. You can't sneak up on Jesus. I'm going to tell you that right now. Isn't that amazing? We're trying to get a glimpse of Jesus, and, and while we're trying to look into his eyes, he, you can't help, you can't cover your heart when you're looking into his eyes. He, if you can look into his eyes, he can look right into your eyes. Isn't that amazing thought? He's try, Jesus, he said, Zacchaeus, quick, come down. I need to be a guest in your home today. And he called him by name. Zacchaeus' name, I mean, think about it. Here's, here's a disreputable tax collector. And yet Jesus calls him Zacchaeus. He calls him by the, his given name. And his name means pure and clean. He's calling this dirty man, this one that's been shunned by society, marginalized, and he says, pure and clean. Pure and clean, come down. I need to stay in your house. He may not have felt that way, he might have, not have felt worthy of his name, but in that moment, Jesus is calling him and reminding him who he was to become. You're still Zacchaeus in my eyes. You're still that person I'm calling you to be. This is, this is the step you need to take where you're at with God right now. If you're going to take any step to get closer to God, start here. And come down off that tree Make room for me in your house because I'm supposed to stay with you. So Jesus tells him to move quickly, come down. It's almost like he's, he's, he's calling him to a humble place, a place of humility. Come down off that tree. Come into a relationship with me. And when he says, I must be in your guest, I mean, th this is a word of insistence. I'm not, I'm not asking your permission. I'm insisting. <laughs> this is happening today. And understand, Zacchaeus understood that this was an honor. Here is a man who has been, for the last three and a half years, I mean, he has been healing, he has been healing the sick, causing the deaf to hear, the, the blind to see, the lepers to be cleansed. And then, and then he just raised Lazarus from the dead. Here is a man of God passing through his city. And of all the places Jesus could say, he wanted to stay with him. He picked him up out of the crowd and says, I'm staying with you. If Zacchaeus would have done anything else, his faith would have went in a different direction. But in that moment, God is saying, no, look here. 
This is where your faith needs to be focused on right now. No matter everything else that people have said, no matter how much society has marginalized you, this is where I want you to keep your eyes on me and your ears open to my word. And so for him, it was an honor. Jesus was not going to keep going that day to Jerusalem. He would stay, surely stay, be staying in someone's house. And for Jewish hospitality, it was considered a good day, good deed. Verse 6 says that Zacchaeus uh, quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. Wow, it all changed that day. In that moment, it, it doesn't matter. Today, Jesus is calling me to himself. I am responding to his words. And in that moment, he's being filled with great excitement and joy. I love that the, to hear the, I always like to read the word joy because I'm reminded with joy, and, and you'll hear me say this numerous times. I mean, we... We, we want to be happy, but joy is so much more important because happiness will always depend upon what happens. But joy arises from a heart that feels loved. You can go through a storm and still keep your joy. You can go through stuff when life goes sideways and, and still keep your joy. And that arises from a heart that feels loved, a heart that says, my God is with me even right now, even through my most difficult pain and circumstances. My God has not abandoned me. I still have my joy. My God still, still hasn't abandoned me. And so he has this great joy and excitement. And, and then verse 7 says, but the people were displeased. They were displeased. They didn't like it. He is gone to be, with the, he is gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, not just a sinner, a notorious sinner. And they grumbled. They grumbled. Hmm. Ever grumble before? I, I'm guilty of the sin of grumbling before. I, gotta, I have to confess right now I'm in church. I've grumbled before. They were displeased. This is a guy everybody hated. This was a guy everybody had given up on. Yet Jesus chose him. Why did he choose my house? I've been good. Why didn't he choose my house to stay? I, I, I already had a bedroom ready for him. Why didn't he choose my house? Wine, wine, wine. Well, I guess... He wanted to be, go to Zacchaeus, because why? We'll find out. You've got to remember, Luke's message was to anyone who has ever been marginalized. And Jesus welcomed. Jesus welcomed all kinds of people into his life. He, the people thought he must have been crazy. He welcomed all kinds of people into his life. You've got to be crazy. This, this can't be right. This cannot be God. But Luke's message was that anyone who has ever been marginalized, this is who Jesus came for. He came for all of us. He came for all of us. John 13, 35 talks about how um, a new command I give you, love one another. By this, all will know by my, you are my disciples by your love for one another. This is what Jesus came to do, to show us how to love. In this moment, we see of, of, of Zacchaeus making a home for Jesus. In this moment, we see Zacchaeus demonstrating how one should respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this moment, he needed the Lord. The Lord came and he welcomed him into his home. Verse 8 says, Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the, to the poor. And Lord, if, if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. All of a sudden, Jesus, uh, Zacchaeus' life began to change. When God stepped into his door, he was confronted with everything that he had done in his past. I'd blown it. I'd blown it so many times. I cheated people. I, I, I was living a life that did not please God. Yet when Jesus, in his great mercy, shows up to this man's life, he cannot help but want to make things right. Jesus came to make things right with him and God. And now there is this abundant flow of grace and mercy flowing in Zacchaeus' life, that he wanted to make things right with people he had wronged. It's really true when Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says all this, this sums up all the law and the prophets, all the law and the prophets. This is the, this, this is the great commandment, and, and he's showing us how he's living this out in his life. Jesus comes. Jesus comes, and we see Zacchaeus responding to the fact that Jesus is coming. 
And we see Jacchaeus now entering into a new beginning for his life. A new beginning for his life. Jesus responded, he said, Salvation has come to his home, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. And in verse 10, he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. What did Jesus come to do? He came to seek and to save those who were lost. Now, I began thinking about, about this and, 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 and the adjustments that Zacchaeus started making for his life once Jesus came in. You know, Zacchaeus never would have done this had, Jesus not, had he not been aware that Jesus was coming. It would have been just another day. Just another day if he, if he was just not aware that Jesus was coming. But there was a buzz in the air. The kingdom of God was at hand. You couldn't hide it anymore. Disease and death were giving away to the deliverer. Jesus was showing up and something was changing in the atmosphere. Yet if, yet if none of that was happening, Zacchaeus probably would have kept on doing what he's always been doing and getting the same results he's always wanted to. But something in the air was changing and it was by God's grace that he began to realize that. When I was reading this, I was caught by the fact that he went up into a sycamore fig tree. Because if you read about fig trees, fig trees are all over the Bible. There, there are stories of fig trees all the way in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned. Um, they covered themselves with, uh, with uh, fig leaves to cover, to cover themselves. They cover their sin to cover their shame. Um, when Jesus showed up on the scene, I remember when he, was, when he was calling his first disciples, he found Nathaniel under the fig tree, sitting under the fig tree. Um, you know, we find Zacchaeus in the fig tree. We find that Amos, the prophet Amos, who lived around the time of Isaiah, Amos was, uh, was a man who tended fig trees. Um, I remember even, even when Jesus left the temple and he went to the, fig, went to the fig tree and saw that there were no figs on there, he rebuked the fig tree. He cursed the fig tree because there, were no, there wasn't any fruit on there. And he's passing by because I, I thought it was interesting because during this time of year, if Jesus had looked up into that sycamore fig tree, there probably would not have been any fruit in there for this time of year. Yet there was something up there. The Zacchaeus was up there in that fig tree. Even if there was only one piece of fruit on that fig tree, he was going to choose Zacchaeus. And it's interesting because if you know anything about fig trees, I love that my dad had a fig tree in the house because I love fig trees. In fact, for my birthday, my son gave me some fig newtons, and I love, I love fig newtons. <laughs> And uh, so that's a heart, that went right to my heart, right there, right in my stomach, you know, that's all too. But, but in history about fig trees, you know, you know, you look in the Bible, there, there are really like seven main staples when you're looking about the crops. You're looking about like Easter time, around Easter they're growing, they're growing barley, around Pentecost they're growing wheat. You know, start heading into the summer, you've got grapes, fig trees, pomegranates. Towards the fall, you've got olive trees, almonds, honey. And so all, these are some of the main staples that they have in there. But fig trees in particular, what's interesting, if you were a, a fig orchardist, I guess that, that would be the proper term, um, one of the things you would know in Israel is that this is not a tree that is native to Israel. They would have been transplanted from Africa. And fig trees in Africa, in order to pollinate, they have these African bees. And they're, they're, they're especially tough bees because what the bee would do, they would go to the figs and use their stinger and and poke, and poke the figs, and it would allow the figs to bleed so then they could pollinate, do all the pollination and, and produce that. But because when they transplanted some of these trees into Israel, they don't have those African bees. So if I want to grow trees in Israel, I, the farmers or the orchardists, they would actually take a nail and poke the nail into the figs to allow it to bleed so that the bees, the Israeli bees, could pollinate. And that got me thinking because it got me thinking about our faith. Because while, um, while our faith is meant to grow, it's also meant to ripen. Let me put it another way. Your faith, your faith is meant to ripen, not just grow. And sometimes when it comes to moral excellence, sometimes we need to be pricked. When it comes to just doing the right thing, sometimes we just need the conviction of the Holy Spirit just to remind us, you know, you need to do the right thing. Sometimes it's not always easy to receive that kind of correction, but we also know that the Lord loves those he disciplines. Get it all the time. I remember one time in, in ministry, I was my first internship, and I was, I was learning what integrity meant about. 
And, it's, it, and you're growing in this area. And I, I remember my pastor would come up. I was interning. And he asked me if I did something that I, and, and, and I almost had done it. I didn't quite finish it, but I told him it was done. I had it, it was done. And I remember I felt, I just felt so bad afterwards because I knew, I was trying to tell myself it wasn't a lie. I almost had it done, but it was a lie. And I remember going back to him and saying, I, I, I was crying because I, I was just, that was just the wrong thing to do. I didn't like, you know what shame is? Shame is like, have you ever eaten something that, that you know, I, I, need, I don't have a good example for it, but you ever eat a piece of food or that just has a bad aftertaste? That's what shame is after sin. You deal with sin, shame is that bad aftertaste. You, say, ah, you just don't like who you become. And I went back and I apologized. I was crying. I said, you know what, I'm sorry, that wasn't right. I, I haven't finished, I need to get through it. And, and he commended me for that. Thank you for making that right. He didn't jump on me. He, he helped me. He restored me. And that day changed my life because I resolved I wasn't going to do that again. I resolved that I was going to be a man of integrity, that I had, I had my words, my behavior and words needed to match. If I wanted my faith to grow in the right direction, I needed to pursue the kind of character that is resembled in Christ himself. I needed to reflect that. I couldn't... I couldn't justify little things. I, if I wanted to do that, I wanted to be better. Not that I was living a life to, to earn something. Not that I was coming into a place of, of turning my faith into something of works, but wanting to better reflect what God has already done for me. Wanting to better reflect uh, his witness in the world today. That the God whom I serve, he's a man of integrity. The God whom I serve keeps his promises. All those things about the future and the, 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 the wonderful things that God promises are true. And my God keeps his word. And I'm going to live that way. I'm going to keep my word to the best of my ability so that you can see a, get a picture of the God whom I serve who's going to keep his word to me. I have hope because my God keeps his word. I'm believing that things are going to turn out in the way he wants to because my God keeps his word. And so sometimes I know that in order, that also, although my faith is, is meant to grow, my faith is also called to ripen. And that sometimes I can also be stubborn with my faith. We can all be stubborn with our faith. And don't be surprised if, if, we're, if, if we're going a little, maybe, maybe God is saying you need to be going 35, but maybe you're only going at 25 miles per hour. God may just stick his foot in your car, put your foot on the pedal and say, no, let's go. Sometimes he may cause a little bleeding to wake us up to something. But he does it not to hurt us. He does it for us to lean upon his grace. And he wants our faith to ripen. He wants our faith to ripen, not just grow. And so I wanted to encourage you today. You know, let me, let me share this with you. Let me give you a, a little takeaway here. There's a lot of things I'm sure you could take from this. But as I was reading through this, I was, I was reminded that, that one of the things I, I want to remember tomorrow morning is that spirit-empowered living, spirit-empowered living, spirit-empowered habits, they are triggered most often when we realize the Lord is on his way. When we realize the Lord is on his way, we, we live differently. How would you like it if pastor just shows up on your door? Hey, I'm here. <laughs> pastor, it would have been better if you would have called first. <laughs> would have been better if you would have called first. <laughs> no, we're here, ready to go. You know, and that's, that's, this, is how, this is how God wants to be a part of our life. But we live differently I mean, when you think about habits, our habits need to be triggered. They need to be obvious. I mean, to do good things, I need to be around. Oh, yes, I need to do this. Oh, yes, I need to do this. But spirit-empowered habits are, are most often triggered when we realize the Lord is on his way. I need to get ready. I need to, get, I need to live in readiness. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. And the thing is, is that, is that when, you, when, you, when you start doing this enough, when you start Putting, I don't know what you need to do. Maybe you need to write a three by five card, but you need to do, instill some habits in your life or reinforce ones or invent some new ones to remind you that the Lord is on his way. I'm here to tell you the Lord is on his way. The Lord, the Lord is getting ready to pass by. I'm gonna give you, uh, I'm gonna challenge you this week. I challenge you to wake up 15 minutes before the sun rises and sit for 15 minutes and ask the Lord to give you the grace of learning the joy of waiting for him to show up. You do that for a while, it's going to affect the rest of your day. 
as you're waiting for the sun comes up, because you know the sun's going to come up. There's no doubt it's going to happen in less than 15 minutes. <laughs> but when you start living the same way as if Jesus is going to show up, your, your life's going to be different. I know I need to make a better decision because if Christ shows up, I want to be ready. I know Christ is showing up. I don't want to wait until that happens. I want to do it now. And start building those kinds of habits to live a life that is pleasing to God. He has given us, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need to live a life that is pleasing to him. Let me tell you, when you start doing this, when you start practicing the Lord, the habit of, 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 of living life as if the Lord is on the way, you're going to come to understand something. Just as Luke spoke about the Lord who doesn't give up on, what the world, on, 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 on those whom the world has given up on, you're going to come to believe that the Lord has not given up on you. It's a wonderful thing when you start believing the Lord hasn't given up on you. Even though the world has given up on you, it's a wonderful blessing when you realize God hasn't given up on me. And when you start realizing that God hasn't given up on you, it also calls you to not give up on yourself. I want to wake up tomorrow morning and say, God, because you have not given up on me, I'm not going to give up on me. I'm going to keep on going. You haven't given up on me. I'm not going to give up on me. I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to encourage other people not to give up on themselves either today. God's going to use you in powerful ways. It's a wonderful thing. How do you make sure? How do you make sure that your faith is going in the right direction? The next step is just, just pursue your character development. There's a, there's a verse in Proverbs. The, the righteous man, the righteous man walks in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. The righteous man, the one who is right with God, the one who is right with God, the righteous man, the righteous person walks with integrity. He, he, he walks, he takes each step with integrity. The righteous man, the one who is right with God, if I am right with God through Jesus Christ, the righteous man walks with his integrity. And guess what? His children are blessed after him. What a wonderful blessing. What a wonderful blessing. God wants to move powerfully in our lives. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you today. Remember, remember that spirit-empowered living and habits are triggered most often when we realize the Lord is on his way. Lord, help us to realize you're on your way. Give us the grace, Lord God, to realize that you're on your way. I pray for my brother and sister that may be going through a, a, a place in their lives where, where it's hard. I pray even right now, Lord God, that you would begin setting in motion some, some tremendous miracles, Lord God, to reveal that you are on your way today. Maybe you're here today. You are going through something in life right now, maybe a storm, a difficult situation in your life. I'm here to proclaim to you today that Jesus is passing by, that your Lord is on the way, that his grace is at, is at the footstep. It is knocking on the door. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it is good news for the poor. It is good news for those who need to be set free. It is good news for those who are shackled and chained today because when the kingdom of heaven comes, there will be a time where there's going to be no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. And through the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, it means today that the kingdom of heaven is at hand where you feel that pain, where you feel that discouragement today. May the heavens be open, the windows of heaven be open to you today for his grace and his mercy to fall upon those places in your life. In the places that seem dry, in the places that seem parched today, may his grace and his mercy rest upon your need today. I pray in the name of Jesus. Now I want you to just close your eyes for a moment because there may have been something, and I, I just want to, I want to encourage you, ask the Holy Spirit today when you read the story of Zacchaeus, maybe he's going to have you read that story later today or sometime this week. But when you take a chance to take a, a second look at the story, ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what are you trying to speak to me through this story? What does the story mean for my life today? What do I need to stop doing? And what do I need to start doing? What kind of person are you calling me to become? And I believe the Holy Spirit's going to do that for you. Lord, give them the grace, Lord God. May your grace descend upon them even right now, Lord God. 
in their lives, in their circumstance. I pray even tomorrow morning, Lord God, when they have that time with you, that you would meet with them in a special way. Touch them from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, Lord God, in their area of need. Remind them that you have not given up on them, Lord. And give them the grace, Lord, to live. Give us all the grace to live as if you're on the way, knowing that you're on the way, I pray in Jesus' name. Maybe you're here today, you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're watching online. You've never had the opportunity to receive Jesus as your Savior today. I want to invite you to do that today. I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to invite you to say that prayer today because God wants to bring you into a right relationship with him. Jesus came to save and to seek that which is lost. I've been lost many a times, but I'm always thankful that I have a Savior. I'm always thank you that I have, thankful that I have a Lord who can always help me get back on track today. And maybe you're in a place today where you need a miracle. You need a touch from God. You need a new beginning. This is what Jesus does. I'm going to invite you to say that prayer with me even right now. Can we say this prayer together? Dear Jesus, I'm so sorry because I've blown it many times. I am a sinner, but I ask that you would forgive me. I believe you died for me and that you were raised from the dead. And I'm putting my trust in you today. Please fill me with your spirit and help me to live a life that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Father, I pray right now, Lord God, for those that have made that decision, Lord, bless them today and touch them, Lord God. May you give them the assurance, Lord God, that they have, uh, if they were to die today, that they are going to heaven and that they would begin a brand new life with you, Lord God, a life that will change not only their lives, but the lives of others. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Amen. I feel someone needs a miracle today. I want to take a minute. I feel we're supposed to pray for someone's miracle today. Maybe here, maybe online, but if that's you today, I'm going to pray for a miracle today. Someone needs a miracle today. So I just want you to open your heart, bring your need before the Lord. It may be you, it may be for someone else. There may be multiple miracles today. But can we together, we agree um, today, as we put our thoughts and our affections upon our miracle-working God today. Can we just lift, the, lift that need today? Maybe for you and maybe for your neighbor today. Could, but I'm praying right now, Lord, I want to pray for my brother and sister today. Pray for them, Lord God. They may, be, they may be here, they may be present, they may be online, they may be sitting on my right or my left today, but I pray, Lord God, for their miracle would you pour out a miracle from heaven today? You are the supernatural God. Your word, your divine word, your, your Holy Spirit inspired word records miracles of blind eyes being opened, deaf ears being, being opened, Lord, leprosy being cleared, the dead being raised back to life, Lord. I pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus for people who are battling uh, maybe a physical illness today, uh, it, it could be even COVID, Lord God, whatever it may be today, Lord. Cancer, Lord God. Um, I, I'm just praying for healing today, for a miracle to be set in motion in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. This is how we fight our battles, Lord God. So we bring them to you, Lord. You have given us the authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and we shall not be injured, Lord. You've given us the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And, and so, Father, we pray, Lord God, that we, we bind those things, Lord, that need to be bound and that you would release your heaven, your, your, your mercies, Lord God, upon these needs that are, we are bringing before the cross even right now. In the name of Jesus, as you are releasing a miracle or setting miracles in motion even right now, receive all the praise, the glory, and the power in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Just begin telling the Lord, thank you right now. In Jesus' name. And we love the Lord. We love the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you for being here today. We love Jesus. And uh, please make sure, stop by columbialifechurch.org. Love to be able to connect with you. And uh, we're believing God for some great things coming into the future. Amen? Amen? Amen. So Lord, we pray, Lord God, for our, for our family, prayer partners, financial partners, our ministry team, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, even today, uh, Lord, that you would dismiss us as you dismiss us. Bless the week. Bless this next month, Lord. And uh, bless the offering. Bless it 30, 60, 100 full for your glory and your honor. Bless the gift and the giver. And uh, bless this people, Lord God. 
Uh, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon them. So we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.